This is Control Structure, episode 143, for May 10th, 2018. See my hovercraft. See eels. It's overflowing with them. This show has notes. Visit thenexus.tv slash cs143 to see them. I am your host today, Andrew Bailey, and with me today is the other host, Stephen Orifice. Hi, Andrew. Hey, your Microsoft is working. It seems to be. So, um, I guess we can go ahead and get started, and unfortunately, there is no Raspberry today. Sadly. Uh, but you know what there is. Uh, so, you know how uh, I built that uh, Ryzen-based PC last year? Yes. Well, it, the successor to the Ryzen CPU has already been released. Uh, the Ryzen Plus-based chips are finally out. And they're benchmarking, benchmarked in everything. And they seem to offer a 10% uh, IPC increase, or instructions per clock. So these chips are clock for clock faster than like the current, uh, you know, old school uh, Ryzen CPUs that I have now. So I was thinking about that. Now, wasn't the one security vulnerability in wasn't your CPU affected and they had to throttle it back some, right? Uh, in a way, but, uh, like, the Intel CPUs were, uh, had, in addition to the one mine was associated with, uh, like, the Intel CPUs got hit really bad, um, but for, like, these new rounds of vulnerabilities, yeah. Pretty much with, uh, Spectre and Meltdown, like, pretty much everything is very insecure right now. Mm Mm-hmm. So I wonder if these new chips are just still impacted and they haven't really figured it out yet, then I wonder. Probably. Uh, But if I recall, these uh, AMD-specific vulnerabilities uh, can be largely fixed through, uh, like, firmware updates. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. So that at least puts them in a good place. Yes. Yeah. Uh, So these uh, chips appear to be uh, even cheaper uh, than the original Ryzen chips, uh, like, how should I say, when they launched. So, like, the successors are actually mm-hmm. cheaper to launch. So That's a pretty good trend. Yes. So it looks like uh, Ryzen, uh, at least the whole Zen architecture, has been a true winner uh, because AMD's stock price is up. Uh, so you get this uh, a pretty cool uh, press photo of uh, Lisa Sue, like, on a runway or something with sunglasses and everything. Uh, but, uh, yeah, the stock price is up, uh, like 15%, uh, specifically because, like, they have winning products now. Mm Mm-hmm. So... So Does that that mean now is the time to buy Intel stock, since it is presumably not as good? Uh, I'm not exactly sure about Intel. Uh, but, yeah, like, Intel is still, like, the number one PC CPU Mm -hmm. producer... And, like, overall, they are a huge company when compared to AMD. Uh, Oh, yeah. And uh, so, hey, you you use Steam sometimes, right? Sometimes. Uh, Has it ever asked you to do the hardware survey? I do not think it ever has. So, occasionally, like, it'll pop up, you know, saying, hey, we'd like to, you know, send your system specifications to our database. Uh, so it turns out that little hardware survey had a bug. Uh, it turns out that some computers and users were being counted multiple times, making quad-core Intel CPUs, NVIDIA GPUs, and Windows 7 the most popular, uh, how should I say, options in those categories. Uh, but after a fix, AMD is faring much better. That's an oddly specific bug, because you would think if it was purely at random, that, uh it would just randomly increase the stats in a, 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 a manner that's not going to really change them much. So uh, it turns out that this fix has uh, represented a 43% growth in, uh, I wouldn't exactly say market share, but uh, uh, share in this survey, that is. So, yeah, you can kind of see how it uh, jumped uh, in, was it around January or so? And then jumped back uh, recently. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, my uh, solid state drive, the uh, 
Samsung 960 Evo. Uh, that successor has uh, recently been released. Uh, but unlike the processor uh, improvement, uh, the solid state drive, like, you know, the NVMe interface has pretty much been tapped out. And uh, the 970 Evo uh, offers only marginal improvements. It looks like we might have to get more and or faster PCIe lanes. Hmm. So, yeah, either either one, uh, the 960 or 970, are still pretty good drives. And, uh, you know, if you're coming from a hard drive, even like a standard uh, SATA-based SSD uh, will do you good. Does put you a lot closer to the the processor with that. It does, uh, but I mean at this point, like how should I say, storage has is now a solved problem. So like you like we've had like very large storage for a long time, mm-hmm. uh, but now we have very fast storage as well. Yes, <laughs> and very big on that. The tiny chip. Yes. Uh, even, even the price per gigabytes. Like, I remember back when a dollar a gigabyte was would have been a good deal yeah. on normal hard drives. Yeah, and I think I saw some deals recently for, like, 500 gig SSDs going for about 100 bucks. Oh, wow. Yeah. So isn't that, that, has isn't that like, your, uh, your make or break point? Uh, my make or break point was the terabyte, I believe. I uh, was when I was going to go there. Kind of what I secretly think is, uh, by the time it gets there, it'll be time to get a new laptop, anyways. So then I'll just let it be what it is. Right on. But uh, hey, speaking about data storage, uh, how about data classes? Uh, like in Python, apparently Python three point seven introduces these sort of dumb objects that uh, just hold data. If you're familiar with Java beans, this is pretty much what they are. So uh, I, I thought the, the whole point of Python is everything's not typed, but this is giving typed classes, data classes. Am I right in seeing how I'm seeing that? Yeah, some of the new whiz-bang Python features that have been introduced over the past few years uh, have introduced these little type hints. Hmm. So, like, this is, like, one of those, like, more advanced features. So there's still give a runtime error, but it's just that it might be telling you more so what it was thinking it should have had. Right. So, and I'm pretty sure that the uh, the runtime does, or does, or maybe can do some optimizations based on the, you know, the presumption that, oh, this is a integer or whatever. Hmm. Um... So yeah, I haven't you know looked too deep into this. Uh, like I'm not sure I really understand all of these. Uh, like as you said, those uh, typed uh, variables. Uh, but it seems to automate a whole bunch of uh, like comparison features as well. Mm. So that can be useful. Yes, and uh, recently uh, XKCD uh, had a little comic about uh, uh, Python environments just being totally messed up about how many different uh, uh, methods of installing packages there are. Then the, I like the the uh, hover text for that X, X, XKCD. Yeah. It says the Python Environmental Protection Agency wants to seal it in a cement chamber with pictorial messages to future civilizations warning them about the danger of using sudo ins- to install random Python packages. Yes, which is uh, actually a joke on the uh, was it the National Nuclear Repository or something uh, that you know was investigating you know in in a far flung future where no one you know even remembers English. How would you tell people to stay away from this place? And they're you know kind of looking into those, uh, pictograms and like also putting like huge spiked monuments in the ground to, like, make it an oppressive feeling place. I, I tend to think that that would cause me to have piqued my interest and to discover what these weird people were worshipping there that they kept in the big steel container. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, uh, and then, 
I think the text was supposed to be like, there is nothing of glory here. Stay away. <laughs> or you will be poisoned. But then again, that might actually attract people. Yeah, it's like, what's in there? Yeah. You can't just leave me hanging. <laughs> yeah, and like there were uh, some other weird uh, ideas too about uh, releasing uh, cats that would glow in radiation. Like giving them genes that would do that. Is they had, is there this was a joke or a real thing? They they were actually contemplating doing these, like in releasing these genetically modified cats into the area. Ha. Yeah, it was it was pretty crazy. I'll I'll have to link that. Yeah, that's that's pretty interesting. So, are you a business? Well, not you, Stephen, but someone else. Uh, do you run Java Eight? Well. Come January, you will not receive free support at all. You will have to buy a license in order to receive support or upgrade. You need to get on the upgrade train, you know? So this is just for businesses who have uh, been avoiding the inevitable and just plain need to go update. Yeah, and you know these big Java uh, shops, they stay on a Java release pretty much forever. Hmm. So, so then they they will have uh, people sitting there. So that I guess that gives their de- support developers, since they have to support it, it gives a way to pay them. More or less. So uh, remember Backblaze? Yes. Uh, they always release the articles with the – let's know how the hard drives are doing. Yeah, they, uh, they did that uh, like a week or two ago, uh, but uh, I didn't really think it was all that interesting. Uh, but they did say that they would come up with a report about how all these helium drives are doing specifically and comparing like the drives of like same capacity or whatever, uh, because helium has uh, some very interesting properties compared to air, uh, uh, just aside from it being uh, lighter uh, in that it has uh, like enhanced thermal properties in that, uh, like, it can distribute heat a little bit easier. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, so it turns out that uh, whatever it is, uh, the helium field drives last a bit longer. Uh, so you can look at the, uh, how should I say, between the helium field, helium filled drives and the air filled drives, uh, the average. Uh, like even like the raw numbers favor the helium drives a bit, but when you add in the drive days, uh, the helium drives tend to come out on top like even more. So it did seem like the numbers were pretty small, but I got the sense from the article they were saying that it, we really need more time for the numbers to probably start shining one way or the other, though. Yeah, but it looks pretty good for the helium drives. Mm-hmm. It's interesting, they were saying that for years manufacturers couldn't quite get the helium to stay, but now they, they think they've figured it out. And so they said there's actually a smart status that kind of lets them know if it's still got the full amount of helium in it or not. So I thought that was kind of neat that they can actually self-measure themselves. Yeah, um, so it looked like uh, only the Hitachi drives report the correct uh, smart drive or smart uh, attribute. So, yeah, interesting. So, you know that uh, 1.1.1.1 DNS? Yes, for Cloudflare. Yes. So, uh, I think we may have mentioned that uh, uh, users of AT&T had problems using this uh, because, like, their gateway was sort of faking the address or something. Um, So, it turns out that AT&T has reported that, yes, this is uh, an accident, and they are working to resolve the problem. I guess that... They aren't maliciously blocking this or anything. Mm -hmm. The telling thing was that they had an alternative address that had some zeros in it and something. Uh, That one was working. So, I think that's the telling thing that it was just something someone hard-coded someplace that they probably shouldn't have done. Yeah. And I, I think this has caused uh, problems like the same kind of issue, but uh, with other uh, things uh, that causes, you know, this to, to not work. So, yeah, uh, make sure you use like the defined RFCs 
for your you know private IP ranges. So uh, this is not exactly uh, you know I should say technology related like you know computers and whatnot. But uh, you remember Tesla Motors? You know they make some pretty neat cars, uh, electric cars, and they want to make more. Uh, unfortunately, it's been they've been having some problems. Uh, so like you know, occasionally the CEO will say you know it's like oh we'll be making like ten thousand cars next month, but only come out to make two thousand. Mm-hmm. And like it's you know Elon has been over promising and under delivering for a long time. Uh, and I think this, uh, might be a turning point. So have you ever been a contractor? Uh, I don't believe I have been a, a, an official contractor before. Okay. Uh, how about a contractor for another contractor? Because I've done that. So, uh, Elon, the CEO has had enough of this charade and he's ordered a full audit of every contractor that works for Tesla. Mm. If a contractor cannot be vouched for by an a direct employee of the company who will be held responsible, that contractor will be dismissed outright. And I think, you know, again, that this will improve things for them uh, because, like, they've been having problems with, uh, like, actual people working in there and, you know, like, behavioral problems yeah. of, you know, like, not showing up to work on time, you know, s- you know basic stuff like that. Uh, one thing that was finding it interesting, the article it had mentioned that Tesla has a history of having to do this in the past. I don't know if it was contractors specifically, but they had some ch- big chunk of people they had to fire. Uh, so it seems like they kind of have a, a hiring problem of who they hire. Yeah, but, but it, uh... it does definitely make sense that if they are saying only only keep contractors who can find an employee to vouch for them, that will definitely thin their ranks and tend to keep the best of the best uh, there that people know are going to do a good job. Yeah, and all the people who are causing problems mm-hmm. will be, you know, will not be there. Yeah, it will do away with some people that aren't part of the problem, but it seems like they need drastic measures. Yeah, It does seem a little bit reactionary, though. Like, I do get that sense that they're, they kind of said the one thing of the, you know, you guys better shape up and then... Then I don't know what the time frame between that and this was, but then it seems like then they just went into this and they go, oh, you guys are all gone now. And then I, I don't know what that time frame was, though. Yeah. So, and I'm pretty sure this could be applied to, you know, the IT uh, industry as well. So, you know, like people who, you know, might not be able to actually get and hold on to a job at any particular place. They just like hop around from contractor mm-hmm. to contract. So, uh, but yeah, too bad that, uh, you know, like full-time steady employment is, uh, you know, not as common, uh, these days. The contractors are easier because then they can let them go and they need to let them go. So, uh, you know what responsive web design is? Mm. Is that where, uh... It's kind of reacting to things you click on and things like that, or is that the the different devices uh the different devices okay like for instance uh on my blog uh, on a desktop you can see that uh, sidebar over there uh but uh, on a phone or if you uh say narrow the window it goes away ah okay so uh you can actually uh do something like that with images uh so like there's actually something like this in the html standard that uh, allows you sp- to specify, you know, if the pixel density is like 2x or whatever, uh, you can display this image that has a higher resolution and everything uh, to display that instead to actually take advantage of uh, smaller but really pixel dense screens. Uh, so because my blog is mostly game screenshots at like 1080p, I've had to downscale those uh, quite a bit in order to fit them onto my blog and to maintain those very fast uh, page load times. Uh, So uh, I started to toy around with that uh, Mozilla, uh, that uh, Moz JPEG thing. Mm -hmm. 
that you know makes really efficient JPEGs. Uh, because I recently got a new phone, uh, which I mentioned in my uh, last uh, podcast. Uh, it's essentially a 1080p screen uh, in like five inches or so, which makes for an insane like three or four hundred pixels per inch. Uh, so I decided to take advantage of that. Uh, but because I write my posts in Markdown, I really don't have to... I don't want to, uh, how should I say, uh, corrupt it and, you know, introduce like the original HTML syntax, Mm -hmm. uh, just to provide these, uh, you know, higher density images. Uh, so I had to, uh, essentially work around that in JavaScript, um, after, you know, complaining about how, you know, the, uh, markdown standard really isn't progressing any. Uh, so I essentially needed a naming convention of how I'm supposed to like name these higher density images, and I essentially decided on uh, appending like the image dot jpeg with image x two dot jpeg, uh, but the x is actually the multiplication symbol. Uh, so like I essentially have to rip apart the uh, like the URL at the last mm-hmm. period, put in that you know, multiplication sign two dot whatever. Uh, so, you know, that, that was fairly simple. Uh, what I did not realize was I needed to update my blog to, uh, recognize like those, uh, was it those URL encoded, uh, URLs like with the percent signs, like if it's not just like straight text, it needs to encode it with percent sign and then like two numbers. Oh, with, like, spaces and things. Yeah, like how spaces become yeah. percent 20. Yep. Uh, yeah, so uh, my uh, blog on my server, like, uh, the part that actually spits out images needed to understand uh, that. Uh, so I got that fixed, and then I realized that, uh, you know, like, these images are kind of heavy. So instead of being a maximum of 80 kilobytes, it's a maximum of 160. Uh, but, like, I did not want to immediately download those and instead, like, wanted to query. It's like, well, uh, would this, uh, how should I say, would the page even benefit from it in this situation? And furthermore, does, uh, like, the image multiplication sign 2 uh, even exist? So in order to do... Uh, like that existence query, I needed to do an HTTP head uh, on that image you know, instead of an HTTP get or post. There's mm-hmm. a, there's another HTTP method that you can do called a head, which oh, really? uh, which is identical to a get, except that you don't actually get any uh, like the resource itself back. You get the uh. response. You get the response code and all the headers but not the actual data itself. Okay. Interesting. So that essentially, you know, the HTTP head is exactly what I need. Um, So then I needed to store this on the image tag itself, uh, you know, whether this, you know, high density image exists. And if it does also, you know, put that in there and also the resolution, the resolution width of the low uh <clears throat> excuse me of the low resolution image uh because like if if it's a high density image and then squishes back down to a to uh like a low density like i need to have some sort of reference for that in the calculation uh so i do some tests and uh you know this requires a little bit of knowledge of like the responsive design apis in the browser so there's a client width on like every HTML element that says, you know, this is how many pixels wide this element takes up. And there's also uh was it window dot pix device pixel ratio, which because like the browser sort of lies to you in how many pixels it uh says things are wide, like those are CSS pixels, not real device pixels. So uh, window dot device pixel ratio uh, gives you, you know, for every pixel I tell you, yeah, you know, these are how many pixels are actually underneath. 
Oh, uh, okay. I see. So then you can calculate the actual width on the screen then. Mm-hmm. So if, uh, like right now, if the, uh, I should say, if the count of those pixels is more than 20% wider uh, than the current image, it'll use the high-resolution image. So, like, even if it's just, like, a little bit wider, uh, it'll use the uh, the high-res image instead. So I hooked up some JavaScript to that. Excuse me. And some... And uh, at least on Chrome on my uh, phone, a really interesting thing happens in that when it's in portrait mode, the low-resolution images will show. But in uh, landscape mode the high-resolution images will show. And I can switch back and forth by essentially switching the orientation of my phone. Oh, nice. Yeah. So then does... I'm reading some of your posts there is talking about the caching and stuff. Uh, So does your... Does it cache it already ahead of time so then it doesn't have to go load it each time you switch it back and forth? Well, I'll speak on that in, like, in the next uh, portion of this. Um... So, yeah, as you mentioned there, that, uh, you know, I actually wanted to see if that did that. So I figured out how to uh, set up a debugger on my phone. So, like, uh, maybe, I'm not sure if you said you've done this, like, hit F12 in a browser, and it pops up the uh, developer tools. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can essentially, you know, do anything you want on a web page. So that you know, does like the current tab that you're on. Uh, But if you install the Android SDK and the USB driver uh, to go along with it, you can actually debug a browser tab that lives on your phone. It's really cool, Uh, especially if you do it in Chrome because there's a uh, like a live preview of your phone right on your uh, monitor there. So oh, if, cool. So, so you have your phone plugged into the computer, and then you jump to the debug mode, and you can actually see it. Yeah. So nice. if, if you look, if you're looking at my uh, blog post right now, the image at the bottom is exactly what the debugger looks like, and you can actually click on that live preview and like click links and scroll and everything. It's it's really it's really cool. Hmm. That it is. So uh, like with that, you can also debug the network requests. So, uh, like, I've actually tested it and seen the, uh, like, it's like, oh, now I need the X2 image. Uh, and then, like, it'll go out and do that. And then if I switch it to portrait again, like, it'll, you can see the sort of network request, but it's cached. And then I can go back and forth and, like, it's all cached once you load it once. So, yeah, it's, it's really wicked cool. And, uh, coincidentally, the... I think it was like the day after I got this working, I needed to use it at work. <laughs> That's handy. Yeah. And I recall doing this with my old phone uh, and actually having to use it at work as well there, too. But, yeah, it's it's really, really cool. So, yeah. Uh, but, you know, again, this uh, I if uh, Markdown actually had these features, I wouldn't have to really do any of this. Mm-hmm. Doing like the custom JavaScript yeah. and stuff. Yeah. yeah. So uh, one thing I uh, uh, was wondering, you know, when I was experimenting with the images, is that uh, the how should I say the bytes per pixel was a lot better on the larger images than on the small ones, and I I couldn't really uh, dig up any uh, like any explanation on this, so I had to think of it on my own. Uh, so, like, my original images are downscaled from, like, 1080p, uh, which is, like, 1920 by 1080, to an image that is 960 by, was it, 540 or so? Uh, and I keep it at, like, 80 kilobytes max, or 80% JPEG quality, uh, whichever is, like, uh, smaller. Which, you know, how to say, at the maximum, it's... 0.138 bytes per pixel. Uh, but then I noticed that if I do the, you know, the raw big images, uh, limited, limit, limiting it to just 160K gets a pretty good image. Now, 
like you would sort of expect because I'm essentially I essentially have four times the pixels that I would need like 320 kilobytes uh, to work with, but it turns out that's not the case. Uh, so like just even doubling the file size makes the image look even a whole lot better, uh, despite you know the quadrupled you know pixel count. Uh, so the only thing I can figure out is that JPEG works on frequencies. Like it divides up uh, like all your image into, I think it's like 16 by 16 blocks. Or maybe it's 8 by 8 blocks. Uh, yeah, 64 pixels each, so it's 8 by 8. And then it does a cosine transform on that to determine the frequencies. And it starts going through these and it keeps the lower frequencies but discards the higher frequencies uh, depending on your quality level. So the only thing I can think of is that making the image smaller makes it a higher frequency image. But if you keep it at the large image the way it is, uh, it's a lower frequency image than if you downscaled it. So like in only doubling the file size, you know, you get, you know, approximately twice the amount of frequencies. Hmm. So you now the com- would the compression be factoring in there too, though? If perhaps it's just the because there, since compression uh, isn't necessarily, um, I'm trying to think how to describe that. Uh, what you can compress uh, may not be like a one to one with the size that you have. I guess is kind of what I'm saying. S- sort of. Uh, like I sort of thought about, uh, you know, again, like the compression, since, you know, you have like more data to work with, you can sort yeah. of compress it better. That's what I was getting at. Yeah. Like you might be able to say, compress a 80 kilobyte file, you know, a little bit, but, uh, you might be able to get a better ratio if you have a 160 kilobyte file. So yeah, I thought that might be the case, but, uh. Like a JPEG is not like a zip in that uh, in that way, I guess. So, like this is just me going off on a branch here. I'm probably totally wrong, but like from what I know, it sort of makes sense in that you know frequencies and you know a, the same in- image smaller makes the frequencies like compress a little bit. It's kind of like speeding up a cassette tape or speeding up a recording or something. <laughs> oh, I see. Because you're as you speed up, it takes less time to watch the whole thing, and that's kind of like your file size. Yeah. So then, just as you but, slow it down more, but because you uh, sped it up, the pitch of like all the voices go up. Mm-hmm. Unless you do some magic to bring them back down. Yes. So, yeah. Unfortunately, I I can't really get the attention of people who would know this so (laughs) (laughs) but uh yeah uh i'd say this was uh pretty fun so i was able Mm -hmm. to like go through most of the images on my blog because i back them up to google drive and like a few other places uh so i was able to like get those recompress them upload them according to a convention and that's pretty much all i have to do I write the blog post exactly the same as I would. So very, very nice. You almost need a uh, tool then that grabs your photos and and adjusts them and, and uh, to the different sizes. Uh, perhaps, but uh, you know, I I can just like make two images. It's mm-hmm. it's not too hard to do. So, um, and uh, oh yeah, another neat feature is that if you increase the zoom level on my blog that the images might switch as well. Oh, really? Yeah. Because it's seen that you're using up more because you're coming in closer, so you're making everything bigger. Ah, yep. so you're spanning more pixels, huh? Yes. Okay, that's Des- interesting. Despite the same pixel density, yeah. uh, it's being displayed over more pixels, so it realizes, hey, uh, a uh, higher resolution image might be useful here. So... Uh, yeah, that that works on desktops uh, in Chrome and Firefox, and I think even uh, like Internet Explorer and Edge too. So mm. yeah, this uh, it's standards compliant. So uh, with that, uh, don't forget to 
uh, back up all your stuff uh, because it's International Backup Awareness Day. So yeah, back up all the photos on your blog, I guess. Uh, which ironically is uh, what uh, Mr. Jeff Atwood didn't do uh, initially that uh, caused him to found International Backup Awareness Day. How about that? So uh, normally I would tell you to submit feedback on the Nexus.tv, but it seems like that's changing. Uh, if you caught the uh, message from the uh, Buckface, it looks like we might have uh, like some kind of Reddit page or like subreddit. So um, I guess I will have to figure out Reddit now. Uh, aside from that, I think that's just about it. Um, aside from personal stuff that's going on. Oh, you know what? Winter is finally over. It was like it is finally over. Like for the past three days, it's been like eighty degrees. Did you get your your bike riding in? Uh, I did on Saturday. Nice. Uh, this past Sunday, it seemed like it was going to be a little bit rainy, so I went up and saw my girlfriend. And initially, it looked like this coming weekend was going to be clear. Not anymore. So I'm kind of uh, angry over that. But uh, who knows, maybe it might clear up or, you know, there might be a you know a wide enough window in the afternoon to go. So who knows? Oh, if it's raining, it's good for me if I plant some trees, though. So two sides of every coin. I guess. Uh, let's see. Also, I want to uh, go out and grill this Saturday, too. Like, I, I have all of my meat. You know, it's mm-hmm. getting it's getting some freezer burn. Uh, also, my buns are getting freezer burned as well. Uh, ah. So, yeah, I, I kind of want to uh, use the grill again and, uh, you know, do a whole bunch of stuff for two weeks. Mm. So, yeah, sounds like a plan. So, how about you? Oh, working in my house this weekend. Like I said, probably plant some trees and uh, I bought a door frame for my my house. I had this giant steel metal door, but uh, it was a wooden wooden door frame, so I got a metal one for it. So fixing things like that, maybe putting in my electric for over by my desk so I can actually ha- plug my computer in <laughs> where I'm working. <laughs> Set of battery power and then last for three hours. Yeah, that uh, might be useful. Yes, very useful. All right, so I guess with that, have a good one. You too.